Good afternoon. Um, I think we'll, we'll get started. I know many of you are confused as to what you're doing here on a Thursday, but this is a Wednesday afternoon lecture on Thursday. Um, and I'm really delighted on, on behalf of uh, the Lambda Lunch Interest Group to introduce today's wall speaker, Joe Handelsman. So J Joe is a, a real pioneer in the study of microbial communities and the interaction of bacteria with their hosts. And I think you're going to hear one story or some, some of that um, today. So um, Joe received her undergraduate education at Cornell and a PhD in molecular biology at the University of Wisconsin. And I don't want to discourage all the postdocs in the audience, but apparently after a year of postdoc, she became an assistant professor <laughs> at, at Wisconsin <laughs> and, um, and, and stayed there and rose through the ranks and eventually moved over to the Department of Bacteriology where be she became chair in 2007. In 2010, um, she moved to Yale, um, where she is a professor in the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology. So um, her work on studying microbes in the insect gut um, has served as a real model for studies of the human microbiome and, and should be really of great interest to, to a lot of this community. Um, in addition to her, her science, which has really been groundbreaking, she's also been a leader in science education. And um, for those of you who are interested, there will be um, a session. She'll be speaking tomorrow morning at 9 in the National Library of Medicine um, Visitor Center about, about science education. Um, that's sponsored by the AWIS. So, um, but she's now both at Wisconsin and now at Yale. She's been a HHMI professor um, or, um, developing novel teaching strategies. She's co-organized Summer Institute on Undergraduate Education, and she's been really interested in, in developing programs for teaching mentoring wherever she's been. So um, there's, hear more about it tomorrow if you'd like. Um, so I won't spend too much time on, on the list of honors. They, they reflect these two strong threads in her career, um, both the innovative science and the excellence in teaching. I, I discovered you had one that I had never actually knew existed, which is a Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring, which you received in 2011. So that's, um, we, we look forward to your talk. The, the title is, is up there. and. Um, Thank you for coming to visit us. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you all for the invitation to be here and for joining us this afternoon. For those of us out in uh, you know, the boondocks, this is like coming to Mecca. So uh, I've been really enjoying finding out what intramural research at NIH is about. Uh, and enjoying the beautiful weather. I can tell you it's much better here than in New Haven today. So thanks for arranging that. So I thought I would talk today about the insect gut and the interactions among microbes in the gut that are both beneficial and detrimental to insect health. My lab is interested in interactions within microbial communities and finding model systems that will enable us to take apart the elements of those communities and figure out how they function, uh, how they respond to the environment and to invaders, and how they affect their hosts. And so I, I decided in addition to the insect part, I would go a little bit further back and show you where some of the molecules that we're very interested in in the insect system came from in a plant system. So I'm going to start with the uh, plant system, plant microbe interaction, and then I'll talk about two insect uh, interactions. But before I do that, I think it's worth mentioning uh, that microbial communities are in the news a lot these days uh, for very good reason. Uh, what has exploded in the, the knowledge arena in microbiology over the last 30 years is the realization that there is essentially no function on Earth that is not in some way mediated by the microorganisms, particularly bacteria and archaea, but some eukaryotic ones as well. And most people I find in the world don't think about the microbes first when they um, go to eat or um, think about taking a swim or whatever you might do, the microbes should be your first focus. And so I just made a list of some of uh, the really important elements of the world around us that are uh, influenced by the microbes. And 
The first is, of course, uh, one of my um, greatest interests, and that's the mammalian gut. And that's one of the most complex environments on Earth. It's one of the most um, it compl complicated and dynamic communities of microorganisms. And we're hoping uh, that our system in insects will be a model for that, and I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, disease suppressive soils, these are soils that have developed the ability to suppress plant disease and keep crops healthy. Uh, this happens as a microbial community. It's not a single organism responsible. It's a complex system and again a very dynamic system of many species coming together to have a, a very uh, noticeable, observable and important effect for crop production. It's one that's pretty poorly understood. As you might imagine, it's very difficult to take these interactions apart. Um, and so that's one much like the human gut that will take an awful lot of dissection because the communities are so species rich and the results in many cases are a little bit diffuse in terms of uh, monitoring host health. Uh, things like greenhouse gas regulation, the degradation of pollutants, uh, the fact that all of our water supply does not have uh, gasoline in it, all of those things are, uh, are affected by uh, and, and kept going by microorganisms. So I think it's important to remember that the microbes are the mediators and the buffers of just about every kind of environmental change, whether that environment is the world around us, um, the air or the soil or the ocean, or is a host or a, a human um, that hosts a community. And it's also important that after about 100 years of trying to get bacteria as pure as possible, typically in single culture or what we call pure culture, uh, we finally begun to realize as a scientific community that the work of microbes is done in mixed species environments and they rarely do their work as uh, single species. And so the challenge of the last uh, decade and I think moving ahead, one of the big challenges in microbiology of the next decade will be taking the magnificent knowledge that we acquired in the second half of the 20th century about microbial genetics and physiology and function in the unicellular and, and single species environment and translating that knowledge into these very complex multi-species environments. So some of the, um, the interest in the gut community comes from a, a lot of recent work that shows that inflammatory bowel diseases of various types, obesity, colon cancer, depression and diabetes all seem to be associated with microbial communities associated with the human body and particularly with the human gut. And this is just an example in a non-human system, a mouse system, of the dramatic effect that the microbes can have on their host. And in this case, uh, the microbes uh, from a fat mouse that was genetically obese were transferred to this mouse here who used to look just like the one next to it and after a number of weeks with these microorganisms in her gut, um, this uh, mouse became extremely obese. And so this is a clearly a very complex disease that has a combination of lifestyle issues, genetic issues, and a very strong component of microbial issues. And so my lab finds those uh, really interesting and the model systems that are available for particularly the first three there uh, are developing very rapidly in mice and even uh, humans, but we think that there are uh, some very fundamental basic research uh, challenges that need simpler systems. So I'm going to talk first about the antagonism between Bacillus cereus and O. mycete pathogens on plants. So once again, this is a two-partner interaction on a host. Then I'll talk about the cooperation, the positive interaction between Bacillus cereus and Bacillus thuringiensis in an, in an insect. And then I'll end with some cooperation uh, between Bacillus thuringiensis and the normal gut community. So the model system that we were looking for had to be very simple. It had to be multi-species to be a community, but not many multi-species. It had to be two or three or a few species. We needed a system that we could use uh, high throughput screening with because one of the, the backbones of what we do is looking for mutants, bacterial mutants, that are altered in a particular capability to identify genes 
that function in a particular way, either in a two-species interaction with the host or in the context of a complex community, which I think is the, the really exciting work that's starting to emerge. We needed a system that could be manipulated, where we could have inputs and measure outputs. And it needed to be large enough that we could do some sorts of imaging and also take blood samples. We knew we were moving into an insect, so, um, or into a, an animal. And so we needed a system that would provide all of those things, which meant that it was simple and yet large. So we tried to get a system going in Drosophila but unfortunately, it's very hard to get Drosophila blood. And so we had a, a major challenge with that. We've worked on it on the side, and I'll present a little bit of data at the very end about uh, what's happened with Drosophila, and I think it is a good model system. But instead, we moved to an insect that is much larger, a caterpillar, and we got led to that by not only it being a great model system, but a really interesting uh, kind of circuitous route that I'd like to tell you about before I move into the insect system. So when I was at the University of Wisconsin, uh, I was uh, in a plant pathology department. I knew absolutely no plant pathology when I started my job, so I started learning it. And I discovered this very interesting disease uh, caused by the omycetes, which are a group of protists that cause devastating plant diseases. One of the, the omycetes is actually the causal agent of the Irish potato famine, uh, and many, many other uh, damaging epidemics of plants. And it can infect, the omycetes can infect their hosts as seedlings or affect them as, uh, as larger plants or even affect the fruit, as you can see here. So this is an example of Pythium, uh, one of the omycetes we study. Uh, and it growing on a cucumber, uh, and that's actually only 24 hours of growth, starting from 500 cells of uh, the omycete. It goes to that massive uh, quantity of biomass in addition to essentially liquefying uh, the cucumber that's un underneath. So th this is a very serious set of diseases for farmers, and they're also really lovely to study because the omycetes produce uh, absolutely gorgeous structures uh, and have some very interesting motility behaviors uh, around both other microorganisms and plant hosts. So these are the uh, critical structures of, um, of Phytophthora in this case, uh, which are the zoospores, which can swim in an aqueous environment and find a target by chemotactic attraction and then infect the plant. And so normally uh, we, we worked uh, in, in this part of the project with alfalfa, which is shown here, uh, partly because it's a tiny little plant and therefore you can grow it in test tubes, which met some of the requirements for a model system, and partly because it's very important to the agriculture of Wisconsin, and partly because it's susceptible to quite a few of the omycete diseases. So we began to uh, look for ways of managing these diseases one of the history, historical facts was that the omycetes were typed as fungi for about 150 years. And many people have heard that a fungus caused the Irish potato famine, for example. And modern phylogeny indicated that, in fact, they are not fungi, they're protists. And they're very distant from the fungi, in fact. And that explained why none of the fungicides that are used to control the majority of fungal diseases on plants are all that effective against the omycetes. So we thought perhaps there are organisms out there that are adapted to the root system uh, that the omycete infects and also able to inhibit the activity of the omycete. So our idea was that, that there are bacteria on the surface of a root that act as a phalanx or a protection against pass oil pathogens. And our prediction was that we could find unhealthy roots, members of that phalanx that would be disease suppressive. And so there's an example of our phalanx. And we went around uh, looking at alfalfa plants that were extremely healthy, had no evidence of infection, isolated culturable bacteria shown here, and then began to test those bacteria that came from healthy alfalfa roots for the ability to suppress disease. And so this is uh, the alfalfa screening system. You really can screen thousands of organisms and mutants, and we've used it for that. Uh, very rapid screen and very easy to manipulate the inputs and the outputs. And so this is an example of the kind of damage that the oomycetes do to alfalfa. 
And this is an example of survival of the alfalfa after being treated uh, with the one of the bacteria that we found in this collection. So in the first screen, we did about 1,000 organisms, and we only found one uh, that was extremely disease suppressive, but it was extremely disease suppressive. It was really effective. Uh, and so we knew that this was an unusual organism since it was uh, very effective and everything else we tested over uh, well over 900 other isolates were ineffective. It turned out to be a strain of Bacillus cereus, which was very interesting because Bacillus cereus is in a group with two other um, species of bacteria that have very dramatic effects on hosts. And one of those is the anthrax bacterium, Bacillus anthracis, which is uh, genetically very, very close to Bacillus cereus and differs largely in the plasmid that it carries that makes it virulent against mammals. The other one is Bacillus thuringiensis, and I'll turn to that um, organism in a minute. Uh, that one is a pathogen of insects and has a very dramatic effect uh, on their survival as well. So it was interesting that we found this new group of uh, disease suppressive uh, bacilli in the same group as there are two uh, very uh, vigorous disease causing agents. And so this is an example of uh, when we coated a seed with Bacillus cereus, uh, we would see um, very good protection. So this is an uninoculated control. This is Phytophthora infected soybeans, and this is after protection um, with Bacillus cereus. So we convinced ourselves that this was a robust interaction and an unusual interaction, and therefore provided a, a good basis for study because there were very solid and robust differences to be looking at. So our first approach was to look for mutants of Bacillus cereus that did not suppress disease. And every mutant that we found that was non-disease suppressive in the test tube assay that I showed you turned out to also not produce a zone of inhibition when tested against Phytophthora. So these are plates. The white fuzzy is uh, Phytophthora spread on plates. The wells contain, uh, each one contains a mutant of Bacillus cereus. And every mutant that we tested that you see is negative here was also negative in the plant assay. So that suggested to us that one of the modes of action or part of the mode of action of disease suppression was some sort of diffusible agent or antibiotic that affected the oomycete. We worked uh, quite hard to purify and determine the structure of this molecule. It was really challenging because it's extremely polar and no chemist I talked to uh, for years wanted to work on it because it's so polar. So we kind of struggled for a long time. And then uh, a wonderful colleague, John Clardy, at uh, then Cornell and now Harvard, uh, offered finally to help us with uh, the structural part. And it was a really challenging molecule because it's in a class by itself. So it's a new antibiotic, but it also represents a new group of antibiotics. So we didn't have a lot of NMR spectra and other um, spectra to help us uh, discern pieces of the molecule as we were working on its structure. There, there just weren't the tools out there for comparison. So we were very interested in figuring out once we had the structure and found that it was, uh, it was inhibitory to both bacteria, certain bacteria and a number of uh, eukaryotes, we wanted to know uh, more about this antibiotic, its mode of action, which I won't talk about today. But also, because it was so new, and we imagined that it had to represent a larger class, there have to be other members of this group out there, because there are so few uh, singletons of anything in biology, uh, it would be interesting to find out how the antibiotic was synthesized. And since uh, this was done in era when we were working very, very hard on figuring out how antibiotics are made, they tend to be very complex pathways. Um, and even the, the well-known ones are difficult to discern. We were a little bit hesitant about this with a new antibiotic structure, new class of antibiotics, and not really knowing where to start. Um, we, so our approach was first to do the safe thing, which was to clone the gene for resistance to zwittermycin. And that was safe because E. coli happens to be sensitive to zwittermycin. So we did a shotgun library in a, a back vector, which takes large fragments of uh, bacterial chromosomes. We put that in, um, in uh, E. coli and then uh, selected for resistance. And so the thinking here was that most biosynthetic pathways carry a resistance gene to the antibiotic that um, is being uh, synthesized by that pathway. 
Because if they didn't, very often they would commit suicide because the producing organism is very often sensitive to the antibiotic it produces. So our prediction was that if we found the resistance gene, we would also find the biosynthetic pathways. And so the idea was then to sequence um, out from the resistance gene and determine whether biosynthetic uh, genes were there. So resistance turned out to be an interesting story in itself. The resistance gene uh, is shown here, ZMAR, and it's uh, part of a large class uh, of, um, of uh, sorry, acetyltransferases um, that is a, a, the GNAT group, a very large group of enzymes. But actually, at the time we isolated it, that group had not been identified. And so we didn't know what to look for uh, in terms of activity. We just had a sequence. So that probably dates me. Um, today, of course, there are thousands of these GNAT sequences in the databases. So we guessed that it was most likely to be uh, an enzyme modifying the antibiotic, since that's numerically the most common mechanism of resistance um, with uh, most of the resistance genes looked at. And so we decided to test for modification of the antibiotic by the gene. And we found that after we treated pure zwittermycin with an extract of a ZMAR-producing cell, we would, in the normal case, um, produce a zone of inhibition. So here we're dropping the antibiotic that uh, the regular antibiotic that has not been treated on a, a filter paper. And you can see it inhibits E. coli quite well. Uh, but here, we have treated it with the ZMAR extract. And ultimately, we purified the ZMAR protein and performed the same experiment and found that the antibiotic had lost all activity. So we determined the structure of the antibiotic after being treated by, uh, with ZMAR. And sure enough, it had been uh, modified. And so you see this amino group on zwittermycin A is critical for activity. And this is the group that gets acetylated, acetylated by um, the acetyltransferase encoded by ZMAR. So we described an actually early member of uh, this group of acetyltransferases that turn out to be ubiquitous in the bacterial world, not only in conferring resistance, um, but also in many other cellular functions uh, as a regulatory feature. So that was uh, interesting in itself because this is an acetyltransferase that works on a compound that really is quite different from um, most of the other antibiotics we know of and most of the other substrates of the acetyltransferases. So that led us to ask, well, if the resistance mechanism is intriguing, then what can we learn from the genes flanking the resistance gene uh, about biosynthesis? Would we find a pathway for biosynthesis there? And in fact, we did. We did a random mutagenesis and looked for mutants that lack uh, the ability to produce wittermycin and also sequenced the genes around ZMAR, which is here, and found that many of the mutants that we made in our random mutant library mapped right near ZMAR in this region um, that you see here. And so every place that there is an arrow, those are mutants that we found through a random mutant search. We've since made mutations in many other of these genes, and they all seem to be essential so far um, for zwittermycin production. Uh, there are about 60 genes in this region. It's a massive cluster of uh, DNA. And we all found that kind of amazing looking at the uh, small uh, kind of petite structure of zwittermycin. Nobody was prepared, at least in my group, for the complexity of the biosynthetic pathway. So as we were finishing uh, the mutant analysis and mapping all the genes that we, we had found, uh, we started to collaborate with Michael Thomas, who is a professor at the University of Wisconsin who studies antibiotic biosynthetic pathways. And he looked at where our mutants mapped and uh, the genes that they fell in and the structure of zwittermycin. And he devised, um, just from a theoretical basis, this pathway for uh, the intermediates in zwittermycin biosynthesis. And that I still can continue to find that one of the great feats of any of my collaborators, because it involved two things. First of all, it involved uh, only some of the genes had been identified. So he was working with partial information about a dozen genes, and the whole pathway um, has close to 60. 
Uh, and second, and even, even more important, was that he had to propose that there were intermediates that had not actually been observed in antibiotic biosynthetic pathways before. And so it, um, the, the pathway that he proposed was related to the polyketides, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. Those molecules are made from repeating uh, units, and there, are, uh, there were four, when we did this work, there were four repeating units known to be used in polyketide synthesis. And the aminomalonyl and hydroxymalonyl uh, had not been discovered yet, and, and this was the first system in which they were described. So there's a real boldness in what Michael did, that not only working with a novel group of molecules without all the genes uh, known, and having to propose two new intermediates uh, in the biosynthesis. And he put that together in a pathway that then he went on to show, uh, to, to demonstrate in vitro and in vivo, was in fact the way that um, zordomycin is made. So it's made on one of these very interesting uh, large proteins. The polyketides are a large class of antibiotics that actually don't look that much like zwittermycin, but they share some important chemical structural features. And in the, the polyketide synthesis, they start with these uh, extender units, and the extender units are pieced together in a sequential way, lengthening the chain, uh, ultimately producing what we call a polyketide. And then those antibiotics are often modified, uh, sometimes uh, cyclized, and often decorated with important um, uh, modifications. And so an example of a polyketide is erythromycin. Uh, that one is um, a very, fairly complex one and requires 125 KB of DNA for its synthesis. Uh, and that has been accomplished in a heterologous system. So that one is probably one of the best understood. And there are a number of others. Um, but you can see some of the features, um, the keto groups, uh, thus the polyketide name. And so this was really exciting because, um, because Michael had been correct that, in fact, there were two genes involved in the biosynthetic pathway um, for these two new extender units, the aminomalonyl and um, aminohydroxyl uh, CoA. And so now the polyketide field has, uh, instead of four, has six different extender units to use in the production of synthetic polyketides. And that's, of course, a big area of interest to try to piece together these subunits in new combinations, new permutations, to create new antibiotics. And so the, the uh, model that Michael developed uh, was, in fact, correct. Um, the antibiotic starts with serine. It involves the piecing together of the polyketide pieces. And it also has a number of features uh, enzymes that look like the enzymes involved in non-ribosomal peptide uh, synthesis. And so this is uh, the complex pathway. I won't go into all of the details. Uh, this part has been published. Uh, but it really, I think, was a, a very exciting feature of uh, Michael's work that he was able to make this theoretical prediction and then reduce it uh, to practice and, and to reality using combination of the mutants that we had identified, sequence, and a lot of really tough biochemistry. So at this point in our work on symbioses, we had found a bacillus cereus that has this dramatic disease suppressive activity on plants. We had found a new antibiotic that was responsible for that activity, but the new antibiotic is actually much more interesting than uh, just for its, act its biological activity because uh, it has a very powerful resistance mechanism due to an acetyl transferase, and more importantly, it's synthesized by a very uh, novel hybrid pathway involving both peptide and polyketide elements. Uh, and finally, that, uh, that pathway provided means to uh, synthesize new, two new extender units that we now know are involved in antibiotic uh, synthesis in nature, making the zwittermycin pathway fairly unique because the, it was the first and still one of very few that uses these extender units, um, but certainly is a major contribution to the combinatorial approaches to synthesize um, new antibiotics. So I'd like to explain now how that work relates to our work with uh, Bacillus cereus and Bacillus thuringiensis and how they come together to affect um, 
insect host, insect hosts. So we, I sort of by accident, found that zwittermycin had a very dramatic effect in a different biological system from the plant system we'd been studying. And so this is Bacillus thuringiensis, which is one of that trio that I mentioned of the bacilli that have dramatic effects on their hosts. Bacillus thuringiensis carries uh, usually one or more plasmids that encode um, the ability to produce, I think you can see it here, this rhomboid-shaped crystalline protein. So the protein actually forms a, a visible crystal inside the cell. So that's the bacillus cell, bacillus spore, and then the crystal toxin is there. This crystal protein has tremendously aggressive activity against certain groups of insects. The one we work on uh, actually affects lepidopteran insects, the moths and butterflies. And as a result of that um, it's very um, high activity of killing insects, but in a narrow uh, spectrum manner, it's been used in agriculture for more than half a century to control insect pests. And the discovery of Bacillus thuringiensis was actually in 1904. It's been well, very well studied. Uh, the insect that we started out with was the gypsy moth, uh, just because it was of interest to a colleague of ours, turned out to meet many of the requirements we had for a simple host model system uh, for microbial communities. And I'll show you some of the features. Uh, and it's very susceptible to Bacillus thuringiensis. And then the third partner was our Bacillus cereus that was isolated from the alfalfa root. Uh, I'm going to talk today about two systems. I will talk about the gypsy moth that was on the last slide. And this is the tobacco hornworm. Um, this really is a real picture next to a mouse. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to have access to was the blood of these insects. Uh, and you can see this insect is large enough that we can get about a mill of its uh, hemolymph or blood out of a single larva. So they grow very fast. They're easy to maintain. They're not susceptible to too many uh, lab-based diseases. Uh, and they're uh, much cheaper. And you don't have to go through um, the, um, the animal uh, health certifications that you have to with mice, because they don't have backbones. Uh, the, these insects are of particular interest to us because of the prominence of the gut in their physiology and uh, anatomy. So this, this is a CAT scan with um, a barium stain in, um, uh, that's just simply fed to the insect. And you can see this whole dark area is the gut. It fills up almost the entire body cavity of the insect. And the rest is essentially hemolymph around it. Uh, around the gut. And so the two things that we're interested in is gut health and how um, the hemolymph or the immune system of the insect interfaces with that. And those are the two features that make up most of the insect's body. Um, it's a very easy system to manipulate because the insect will eat most things that we feed it if we uh, hide them in uh, the normal food. Um, we can put anything from zwittermycin to um, plant material to other antibiotics, and uh, the insects don't seem to um, reject them. So this system and the gypsy moth system are the two that I'm going to talk about. And we found very similar results. I'll point out a few of the, uh, the places where they diverge. But um, if I'm talking about a gypsy moth experiment, you'll see a gypsy moth. And if I'm talking about um, a tobacco hornworm, you'll see uh, a picture of one. So the thing that we found somewhat by accident was that this very interesting antibiotic, zwittermycin, that has anti-oomycete and antibacterial activity also had a tremendous ability to uh, synergize or potentiate the activity of Bt toxin. And so here we're looking at insect mortality with increasing uh, amounts of zwittermycin. We have a constant amount of Bt toxin. So without any zwittermycin, you can see there's about 20% uh, mortality uh, in the experiment. But as we increase the zwittermycin uh, content of the food, we see a dramatic increase in the killing uh, by Bt. This is still to this day, we discovered this a number of years ago, and to this day, there's uh, no synergist that we can find or is in the literature that comes even close to uh, the, toxi the, the potentiating ability of zwittermycin. And we've looked very far and wide for other compounds uh, that would do the same thing to begin to understand why uh, compounds will synergize um, with BT, and we haven't found them. So we we're, we're on, have an ongoing study of looking at the mode of action of zwittermycin 
Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we started down that path and got a little distracted, but um, we've gone back to that. So this antibiotic is active at nanomolar levels as a synergist. It's actually much better as a synergist quantitatively than it is as an antibiotic. But yet, the only thing we knew at the time we did these experiments about the activity of zwittermycin was that it is an antibiotic. So the simplest hypothesis we could come up with uh, for its activity was that it was affecting um, the phalanx again. So once again, we imagined, just as we did on plant roots, that the uh, insect gut has a microbial community that protects it from infection by pathogens such as Bacillus thuringiensis. And the obvious prediction from that would be that if zwittermycin is killing off some of that community or all of that community, the insect no longer has that protective barrier or phalanx, and it becomes more susceptible to Bt. So that was a reasonable hypothesis to test. And so we wanted to find other ways. First, we wanted to look at the effect of zwittermycin on the microbial populations in the gut, and then look for other ways of accomplishing the same end and see whether we uh, accomplish the synergy. So the first experiment we did was very simple. We just wanted to use a battery of antibiotics, wipe out as many members of the gut community as we could in one treatment, and then see if we got the same kind of synergy that we did with BT. So the first part of that was to, de to determine what organisms were in the gut. And so we did a culture-based analysis that demonstrated in the gypsy moth there were seven organisms, all members of the uh, firmicutes, and which are the, the low GC gram-positive organisms, and the gamma proteobacteria. So very simple at the phylum level, and then we did see some variability and uh, variations between individuals and between populations of gypsy moths at the genus and species level. But in general, Enterococcus and Staph, Enterobacter, and Pantoia were the organisms that we saw consistently in the gypsy moth uh, gut. When we did a culture-independent analysis, looking at the 16S uh, rRNA distribution in the insect gut, we found um, three additional organisms that diverged uh, reasonably deeply, actually, from known species. They seem to be new species, but known genera. And once again, they fell in uh, the proteobacteria and firmicutes and phyla. But in this case, we added the alpha proteobacteria with an agrobacterium, which comes and goes, is sometimes in uh, the gut and sometimes not. I'm going to talk uh, now about two organisms that we've studied the most. One is Enterococcus faecalis, and the other is Enterobacter. Uh, Enterococcus is gram-positive, and Enterobacter is gram-negative. Both are found in the human gut. They're both pretty well distributed, uh, if not ubiquitous, in the guts of uh, all animals that uh, I can find that have been looked at. So we thought these were nice models to study gut interactions, in addition uh, to the fact that they have very similar effects in the experiments that I'm going to tell you about. OK, so we went back to, uh, now that we knew who was there, going back to reducing the populations using antibiotics and asking um, if you eliminate the bacterial community, at least as far as it can be detected, uh, what happens to the susceptibility of the larvae to Bt. And so on this slide, you're seeing an increase in concentration of antibiotics, and which presumably, and I'll show you data that support this, uh, would be correlated with a reduction in the bacterial community of the gut and the larval mortality. And you might notice that the curve here goes in the opposite direction from what we predicted. We predicted that as you increase antibiotic uh, concentration, the phalanx, or protective bacteria, would drop in population, and the insect would become more susceptible. Instead, we saw a reduction in mortality. So this is with Bt. This is just antibiotics with no Bt, and there's little effect uh, on mortality uh, with antibiotics without Bt. But with Bt, there is this very dramatic drop in activity as the antibiotic concentration increased. And at the point where uh, we found no more culturable bacteria, and that was at 125 micrograms uh, each of a cocktail of four antibiotics, that was the point at which um, the curve converged with uh, no larval mortality. 
So we found that our phalanx hypothesis was um, absolutely uh, not correct. Uh, there was no way the data were supportive uh, of it. So we had to go back to the drawing board and reconsider our results, that if zwittermycin is not just wiping out the community, uh, as this last experiment uh, did very well, um, if that's not the mechanism of synergy, then what else could be going on? And so we turn more to emphasize the uh, Bacillus thuringiensis interaction with the community, and we turn to what we call the traitor hypothesis, where the bacteria that are normally in the gut of the insect turn on the host and assist Bacillus thuringiensis in killing the insect host. And so we propose that, in fact, some of the normal commensal gut bacteria that do not cause any harm to the uh, insect under normal circumstances collaborated with Bt, and that led to uh, death of the caterpillar. And then if we uh, restored the gut inhabitants, then if this hypothesis is correct, we should restore Bt killing. And so we saw in the previous slide that we could reduce the uh, bacterial community to undetectable and lose Bt activity. So the next step was to try to restore uh, members of the community. And we've tried this with Enterobacter and Enterococcus. And I'll show you data for both. So this is on the gypsy moth. And you can see with no antibiotics, if we feed Bt, we see 100% mortality. So in this assay, we're using a pretty high level of Bt. Uh, in this case, um, we don't see an effect of adding more bacteria, presumably because the gut already contains uh, bacteria, so there's essentially no effect uh, on mortality. But on the antibiotics, uh, we see a reduction of Bt killing uh, when there are no bacteria measurable in the gut. But if we add back the Anaerobacter to Bt with the antibiotic-treated animals, we see a very dramatic uh, pattern of restoration of killing. So this was repeated many times on uh, gypsy moth as well as other insects, and among a very wide di diversity of Lepidopteran insects, um, we saw the same trend, that antibiotic treatment reduced Bt activity, sometimes uh, completely wiped it out, other times uh, dropped it, and restoring the gut community or certain members of it restored killing. And so this is an example of Manduka. This is the tobacco hornworm um, that we work on mostly now. And you can see uh, here the only real difference is that Bt alone does actually kill um, the antibiotic-treated animals. So we don't completely wipe out Bt activity by reducing the uh, microbial community to undetectable. But it's clearly a much weaker activity than we would see um, in the presence of the normal community. But then when we add, in this case, Enterococcus, uh, which is a member of both the gypsy moth and the tobacco hornworm guts, we can again increase uh, Bt activity quite, um, quite well and back to what it would be with the native community there. So this is uh, now a consistent story with a number of insects. Getting rid of the gut bacteria reduces Bt activity. And now with two different species of bacteria, one gram positive and one gram negative, that both restore activity, uh, Bt activity to, um, uh, to the, uh, killing the insect. So we were pretty curious about this, because Bt has been studied for, as I mentioned, well over 100 years. It was discovered in 1904 simultaneously in Japan and Germany, and has been one of the great curiosities of uh, insect-microbe interactions. And there's enormous amounts of work on the mode of action of the toxin, how the toxin uh, forms pores in the epithelium of uh, the gut. Uh, and, and that has been assumed to be the mode of action of how it kills. But no one has really taken that to the next step of, okay, so there are pores in the gut wall, but why does that actually kill? And the answer to that was, and I think remains still not completely clear, but I think we have some hints about why that's important. Um, in some, under some conditions, we find, particularly when we've uh, gotten rid of the gut community, that the pores occur, the Bt will insert into the, the epithelium and form pores, but then they can heal. The insect has a tremendous ability um, to heal over the gut epithelium and replace the cells that have been damaged. And so the insect doesn't necessarily die just because it has pores in its gut. 
So we wanted to examine what happens to the gut epithelium uh, with BT and the, the, um, the gut bacteria. We wanted to examine the hemolymph, and that's interesting because in insects, the hemolymph doesn't carry oxygen the way our blood does, but it acts entirely as the immune organ. It's the, the, the full, pretty much full location of the hemocytes, which are uh, the immunologically active cells in the insect. So we wanted to examine what was going on in the hemolymph and then what were the hemocytes doing in terms of mounting an uh, immunological response. So the first step was to look at the gut wall, which had been done many times with BT, um, but, but had never been done with and without antibiotics. And you can see that in the absence of treatment or just with antibiotics alone, uh, the epithelium has uh, a nice regular structure. Uh, the epithelial tissue has microvilli, and um, we can even see the crypts that are typical of the mammalian gut as well. So it has a lot of features in common with all other guts that have been studied, and it has a, a very regular and discernible um, structure. But when we inoculate with BT and Enterococcus, we find that uh, there's this complete disorganization in the same amount of time. Uh, as these were incubated. And we lose cell integrity, we lose uh, visible cell structure and cell walls, and there's no uh, microvilli structure left, so presumably the insect will have uh, quite a hard time taking up nutrients. BT uh, alone will cause a small effect like this, but nothing is dramatic, um, and enterococcus alone has no effect on uh, the gut wall. So we wanted to ask then if this gut wall is becoming so disintegrated as a result of being treated with uh, BT and enterococcus, then what's happening in the blood? Because all of a sudden there are now holes in the gut wall that make for um, regular conversations between the hemolymph and the gut. And so in this case, uh, we fed uh, enterococcus alone or enterococcus with BT and then we withdrew blood samples from uh, the insects, and this was done with uh, the tobacco hornworm, which is much easier to bleed than most insects. And so you can see that uh, when we cultured from the hemolymph, uh, in the absence of, um, we just fed enterococcus alone, um, we saw it at either three hours or 24 hours after feeding, we saw no bacteria in the blood. So like us, the insects have what appears to be uh, nearly sterile blood. But if we fed the enterococcus uh, with BT, and those are shown here, uh, we found massive populations. Um, this is up to 10 to the eighth per mil of blood, uh, enterococcus uh, colony forming units. And so this was a dramatic difference. This suggested that the enterococcus could enter uh, the, the insect through the gut uh, into the gut and then through the gut wall if BT was there, suggesting that BT was not really the killer in this case, but was providing a route for uh, enterococcus to reach the blood and be the pathogen. And so we proposed that if this were the case, you would imagine that enterococcus directly injected into the hemolymph would have the same impact. And sure enough, when we fed enterococcus, we saw 100% survival, no effect of enterococcus. These are just uh, healthy uh, caterpillars, no BT involved. And then when we injected enterococcus, you can see there's a pretty rapid uh, mortality that occurs within a day of injection. So this suggested to us from uh, the, the shape of the curve and the nature of the death that we saw that this was very similar to uh, what we observed when we treated with BT and, uh, and the native community. And that suggested the hypothesis uh, that the gut wall being breached simply allows the gut bacteria, the normal commensal and benign gut bacteria to reach the blood. Well, this is the mechanism by which it's estimated about half of the sepsis cases in humans occurs, um, that about half of them probably originate with bacteria that live normally in the gut and are benign, but when the gut wall is uh, damaged for some reason or uh, either immunologically uh, or through physical perforation, then bacteria can reach the blood, and that leads to sepsis, septicemia, which means um, 
bacteria in the blood and ultimately sepsis, which means death by or, or serious disease uh, by having bacteria in the blood. So we want to propose this model as a, a, a model for sepsis. One of the reasons that we found that kind of exciting is that sepsis is a very rapid disease. It takes about 24 to 48 hours for an unchecked case of sepsis uh, to kill a person. And so it's very difficult to do research on. Uh, physicians are usually just struggling so hard to keep their patients alive that they're not going to try experimental uh, treatments, and there's very little time to look at the parameters, the changes in host physiology or bacterial behavior uh, during a case of sepsis. Strangely, there are also not very good um, models for sepsis in other mammals, uh, such as rodents. There are some peculiar ones where they, um, they use um, uh, foot pad injections or uh, perforations to introduce bacteria. But apparently, according to people who uh, know sepsis symptoms in humans, it's not a very good model. And so uh, we were pretty uh, enthused that this could become a model for figuring out how sepsis occurs and how to prevent it. And some of our more recent work um, pertains um, to that. And so based on the, the human uh, sepsis model, we proposed that BT was killing by inciting an overblown inflammatory response that's actually responsible for killing the host. And so this is very much the model in humans that it's really not the bacteria that kill us, it's the massive innate immune response that we, ho that we mount uh, in, in response to the bacteria um, that is the toxic uh, and ultimately fatal uh, element in the disease. Well, insects are nice in this way that they have an innate immune response that is very similar to ours. In fact, a number of the elements of the innate immune system of people were, were discovered in Drosophila in insects. Um, and so the, the analogies are quite powerful. But the insects don't have the adaptive immune response, the ability to produce antibodies um, to complicate things. So it's kind of a streamlined inflammatory response that I think is much easier to study because it's, um, it, it is in the absence of the more complex immune response of humans. So here we have the progression of the disease. We looked at the insects at a macroscopic level, the structure of the uh, the, the wall of the epithelium. We looked at the blood in the hemolymph. Could we see bacteria? And then we looked at the hemocytes in the blood. And so this is the healthy animal where you can't see any bacteria in the blood. The hemocytes are circulating as uh, single cells, and the villi are in good, um, good health and structure. By 24 hours, we're starting to see a little bit of uh, discoloring of the insect at a macro scale. And the villi are beginning to show some gaps and spaces between them and get uh, a little bit of that disorganized look that we saw so dramatically um, in the previous slides. We still see no bacteria in the hemolymph, but we start seeing an indication of an immune response, which is um, usually indicated first in insects by the clumping or aggregation of their hemocytes. And so these immune cells begin to clump long before there's actual exposure of the cells to the bacteria. So this is clearly a circulating uh, uh, chemical that's inducing the, um, the response. And then by two days after inoculation, the insect is uh, largely melanized. And so the melanin, its dark pigment, uh, is an indicator of the innate immune system being turned on. So usually you see first the beginnings of aggregation of hemocytes, and then you see the darkening of the body. And that's an indication of, um, of innate immune response. We couldn't do much with the gut wall in this case because the, the insect under these conditions was pretty squishy inside. There wasn't in, enough integrity to get samples. But we were able to take blood samples. And these did have, uh, it might be a little bit too light to see them, but they did have uh, abundant bacteria in them at a very, very high titer. And the aggregates of the hemocytes had continued to um, increase in size. So we had all of the markings of the innate immune response of the lepidopteran host, uh, the melanization, hemocyte aggregation. And then we wanted to look at some of these other elements. So the COX and the toll-regulated um, genes are, very, are critical both in mammals and insects. 
uh, for expression of the total immune response. Part of that response is the production of nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species. Another outcome of the uh, Cox and Toll receptors being turned on is the production of antimicrobial peptides, which ultimately is one of the, the mechanisms by which the immune response reduces bacterial load. So to uh, follow up on the uh, visual uh, markings of the immune response, we turn to a pharmacological approach and ask whether suppressors of the innate immune response had any effect on BT killing. And what we found was that not all, and it depended upon what their uh, targets were, but some immune suppressors, like, for example, indomethacin, which is um, shown here, would prolong the life of the insects. And so here we're seeing um, larval survival, so anything above the dotted or dashed line indicates that the treatment is increasing uh, survival compared with the control. And so indomethacin at various concentrations uh, clearly has a, a statistically significant effect on survival um, and both increases the length uh, of uh, the, the duration of the insect's life and then also keeps many of them alive. Some treatments that we tried of this type only increase the duration of life, but ultimately they all died anyway. Uh, another one is glutathione that also affects aspects of the uh, innate immune system. And then uh, this one was one that has given variable results, but is a familiar enough anti-inflammatory agent, aspirin, uh, that we were quite intrigued to test it. And this one seems to be um, host-specific, that it seems to have more of an effect on um, reducing BT killing and reducing the rate of killing in some insects than others. And we don't, we don't have a, a mechanism to explain that yet. So this was certainly consistent with the inflammatory response being uh, responsible for killing. Uh, we've compared the effects on tobacco hornworm and uh, gypsy moth. And once again, uh, you can see in the, in the tobacco hornworm experiment, uh, we have 40% survival uh, after three days of treatment with BT alone. And both ibuprofen and aspirin um, give a statistically significant increase in survival. So now with two insect species and quite a few different uh, immune uh, uh, inflammatory suppressants, we found uh, an effect of increasing survival, reducing BT toxicity, which is certainly consistent with the innate immune response or the inflammatory response being responsible for killing. So the corollary of that experiment was if we could induce the innate, innate ex immune ex um, system to um, have a full-blown inflammatory response without the bacteria there, could we observe the same kind of killing with BT uh, as we did with bacteria? So these were uh, axenic larvae or treated with antibiotics. When we treated with BT alone, uh, they were uh, killed in a, about 6.6 .6 days. That's a, a time to death, time to 50% death. Um, Enterobacter uh, was, in this case, gypsy moth was the host, so we used Enterobacter as um, the cooperative agent, and that certainly reduced uh, the time to death, it, nice virulent treatment. And then instead of using Enterobacter, we tried a number of different elements from cell walls of bacteria, in this case, a lysozyme-treated peptidoglycan prep. Uh, with the BT, and you can see that that speeded up death even more than the Enterobacter did. So this is an example where even in the absence of live bacteria, uh, we have a chemical treatment, peptidoglycan, fragments of the, the cell wall, um, that incite an immune response and also cause death, suggesting that one of the mechanisms by which BT kills uh, is by enabling the bacteria from the gut to reach the hemolymph and induce the classic inflammatory response um, symptoms. And we're in the process of testing some of the other elements of this. So I am just about running out of time, so I will just very quickly mention uh, a, a new direction that we've been taking the last couple of years that I, I think is beginning to um, yield some very uh, exciting data. So one of the challenges in all of these experiments is that the bacteria that we introduce have to invade an active community. So it's a community that has a structure and a function and interactions, 
and it's an existing community. And we're adding bacteria that have to survive. And we certainly know from probiotics experiments in humans that introduced bacteria are actually very hard to establish in the human gut. And that's true in insects as well. And so we want to look at the genetic basis for invasion ability. So what makes a bacterium able to invade an active, normal, uh, intact community? And on the opposite side, what makes a community able to either resist or not invasion by uh, a newcomer? So we did an analysis of uh, genes that are induced in the gypsy moth gut, asking, in this case, uh, we used Enterococcus faecalis, asking which Enterococcus genes were turned on in the gut. And we used a genetic system named uh, Rivet. We can talk about that later if anyone's interested. So we found a number of genes, and the ones that we kept coming up with over and over, that were overrepresented in our libraries from the gut, were the ones we studied first. And we found a few that we immediately, we saw we picked them up, for example, 36 times in the screen. We thought they were likely to be good candidates uh, for important phenotypes in the gut. So we knocked out those genes. And in this case, um, <clears throat> the uh, red bar is um, one of real interest here. So this is a mutant in um, uh, RAD A, so it's a, a DNA recombination uh, protein. And when that uh, bacterium, that mutant, is inoculated alone, so that's the red bars, it doesn't seem to survive quite as well, although it's not bad compared to the wild type, uh, which is the black checkered bars. And so we just feed the bacteria the same way, and there does seem to be a small difference in uh, this mutant. But the really interesting data were when we inoculated this RAD-A mutant along with a wild-type strain. In that case, the RAD-A mutant, you can see here, is almost gone by uh, the end of the fifth day. And so this does seem like the genes that we isolated from the rivet experiment that are turned on in the gypsy moth gut are apparently required for competition against another member of the gut community. And so in a clean gut, an exenic gut, this mutant does reasonably well, but in the presence of competition, it falls off quickly. The more exciting experiment, and I'll just mention this um, because it's data we just got last week and I can't resist talking about it, um, was a similar experiment with the same types of mutants. Uh, this is a mutant that was also found in the Rivet experiment, um, but in this case it maps in a gene that doesn't have very good homology to anything, but it looks like it might be involved in um, uh, central metabolism. It, it's a very peculiar uh, sequence, so we're still working on, on the uh, sequence analysis. But in this case, we use Drosophila as the host, and Drosophila has a very robust and simple gut community, two major genera, and that's it. But it seems like anything we do to it, it bounces right back, very elastic community. And in this case, when we inoculated uh, this mutant in um, uh, the central metabolism genes, so this mutant 1918, when we inoculated it into the normal gut community of Drosophila, it was dramatically reduced compared to the wild type, which again is the black uh, checkered bars. And so uh, that, and eventually we've taken this out a little bit longer now. Uh, I believe the data just came in today, and it looks like um, the mutant is continuing to decrease. So we're very excited now because we have um, the ability to look at host genetics in Drosophila. We can begin to manipulate the uh, environment in which this community exists. And we have identified at least one gene that seems to be important for invading the normal community. What was interesting is when we treated with antibiotics and gave um, this mutant 1918 every advantage uh, in terms of just being able to colonize the host without having to um, invade the community, it was just like the wild type. 
So this is, as far as I can see, the first real indication that it's possible to identify mutants in this invasion phenotype that aren't just unable to grow in the host or unable to attach or something like that, but they really are specifically affected in the ability to compete within a community. And so I'm hoping this is the beginning of uh, beginning to understand um, the nature of communities and the dynamics that govern uh, invasion and resistance to invasion. So I've shown you today a number of interactions, um, <clears throat> the Bacillus cereus and Oomycete interaction mediated by Zwittermycin that is an antagonistic one. Uh, the Zwittermycin interaction with Bacillus thuringiensis, which you could consider a cooperative one since they work together to kill the host um, that Bacillus thuringiensis uh, thrives in. Uh, we discovered uh, through a, a sort of uh, indirect means this very unusual antibiotic that has not only an unusual structure, which still has only, uh, it's the only one of its kind uh, known, but also has a unique mode of synthesis and that uh, led to the discovery of two new extender units for polyketide synthesis. And finally, uh, Bt uh, kills many different Lepidopteran species in cooperation with the normal gut microbiota, and we believe that that mortality is associated with an overblown or um, uh, pernicious inflammatory response. And that's partly supported by the fact that anti-inflammatories reduce mortality. So obviously there are more questions raised than answered by this work, as is always true in science. Um, we're certainly interested in the molecular triggers of the innate immune response in this insect system. We're interested in other interactions between the members of the microbial uh, community and between the community and invading pathogens. And then we continue to work on the mechanism by which um, zwittermycin exerts its synergistic effect and its antibiosis effect. And I'd like to thank all the wonderful people who did this work. Uh, the insect work was largely pioneered by Nicole Broderick, an uh, undergraduate and then graduate student in the lab, uh, who did essentially all of the gypsy moth work I showed, and um, John Holt, who helped us set, develop and then generated a lot of the data for the Manduka system. And he also single-handedly uh, set up the Rivet system and developed the, um, the mutagenesis uh, approach. Uh, the Zwittermycin work depended upon John Clardy, the uh, chemist who, uh, whose postdoc, Haiyan He, uh, determined the structure. And uh, the biosynthesis work was done uh, by Michael Thomas and a graduate student, Yilan Chen. And finally, I'd like to thank my funders, NIH, most appropriately here. Uh, it's really uh, nice to be able to thank uh, the people that make this work possible. Uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and uh, NSF also contributed to um, the work done here. And with that, I'll stop, and sorry we ran over so much. requires the toxin, the Bt toxin? Um, we can induce an innate immune response without the toxin by a number of different means, and the toxin does seem to contribute to it. So it's, it's not either way. Um, it's we a can, little of each. It's, yeah, it's a little bit of each, exactly. And it has slightly different features when the toxin is there. Yeah, that was uh, very nice. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, but I was unaware until uh, a year or so ago, uh, many Drosophila, and actually 70% of insects, are felt to have an endogenous, you know, an endosymbiont that mm -hmm. lives intracellularly, even in their own organ. It's called the, you know, um, biotome or whatever. Um, and that is like a Wolbachia, which has its, an example of a free living insect. Are you aware of any? interaction between the endogenous endosymbiont and the gut, which are, are truly actually outside the animal uh, and not in a cell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. We um, have not seen, physically seen, the endosymbionts um, in the Lepidopteran hosts, but we assume that they're there because, as you say, they're pretty much ubiquitous. 
And it's very hard to find cured insects that have lost those symbionts. So I, it's a hard question to address. I'm not exactly sure how we would do that. Um, one of the systems that I think could be used is one that Nancy Moran has developed, where the entire genome of both the host and the symbiont has been sequenced. And that might give us some clues if there were an interaction. We would at least know some of the genes to, to look for in that interaction. I'm pretty sure there are, you know, Drosophila that have lost it. Have and, been cured. And they it, yeah. have treated some Drosophila and lose it. But of course, the Drosophila genome the, contains the full genome of this uh, Wolbachia that was discovered in 2005. They've deposited their whole genome into the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Take, taking some of your results together, the Zwittermycin plus the BT results and the BT uh, plus Enterobacter enterococcus. So these results suggest that the Zwittermycin is killing some bacterial bacteria in the community that are protecting them from Enterobacter when you treat them normally with just BT alone. So you have an idea of what, what the bacteria are that are protecting against Enterobacter? I'm not sure I see the evidence for killing bacteria. I, I don't think that's the mode of action because we can kill all of the bacteria with a very harsh antibiotic. Um, uh, yeah, so you're saying protection. So, so from I'm guess I'm saying if you feed BT alone or BT versus plus zwittermycin, you get an additive effect. If you add BT alone, I mean, if you add BT along with Enterobacter, you get a synergistic, synergistic effect on killing. Mm -hmm. The enterobacter are normally there, right? Mm -hmm. So that suggests that somehow they're, they're, that the organism is being protected against the enterobacter that there when you normally feed them BT. No? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, we can kill off all of the bacteria and see no killing unless we add uh, an immune incitant, such as fragments of peptidoglycan. So that kind of gets around the bacteria. My bet is that it's an interaction directly between zootermycin and perhaps the BT toxin. Okay, so, so if you take a cell that's wiped out for bacteria mm -hmm. and then add BT or BT plus zootermycin, you see, still see an additive effect of adding zootermycin. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, yes, we have done that, so, right. Okay, all right. So Jermaine and then we'll... I just have a question about your the mice model that you showed. Um, could you, in other obese mice, do we find, can we um, identify either bacteria communities that, that cause the obesity in the other mice that you showed? That caused the what? The obesity, the, oh. the picture that you showed. The yeah, so it turns out that it's, it's pretty complicated. I think it has gotten more complicated since that initial discovery was made. Um, there isn't a single bacterium, but it does seem to be related to the ratio of the two major, two of the three major phyla, the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes. And a lot of the nutritional aspects that are associated with the gut um, seem to be linked to the fatty acid metabolism, particularly of the Firmicutes, which produce um, the short chain fatty acids that the human body can use. So the more efficient they are at converting food that we take in to fatty acids, the fatter we get. So, so we should end here. Um, I will remind you that there is a reception today in the library, thanks to the FAES. Some of you may have noticed that there hasn't been for a few weeks, but we're back in business. So I invite you to come and continue the conversation with Joe and with each other. Thank you very much.